Today we'll be talking about the postural evoke response test, which is uh, w one of the motor control tests in the uh, your dynamic equilibrium model. Uh, we're on the motor side of the model now, and uh, the Neurocom suite of tests has evaluations for many different forms of motor system output. The postural evoke response test focuses on reflex responses. So these are spinal cord level responses. They're very fast, on the order of 30 to 50 milliseconds. Uh, and uh, they're rapid, stereotypical, and they trigger those anti-gravity muscles that push us uphill against the force of gravity. The purpose of the postural evoked response test is to identify pathology within these reflex response pathways. Uh, and what we'll be looking at is the latency and amplitude of the EMG responses that we're recording using surface electrodes. Our stimulus is rapid toes up tilts. Our response is these averaged reflex response latencies and amplitudes. And when we record from gastroc and tibialis, we're looking at three responses. The short res latency response is our myotonic stretch reflex. The medium latency response from the gastroc is our segmental response. And then the long latency component from the tibialis is the actual postural control response that puts us back into a stable position. And they all have a range of norms for latency and amplitude that we'll be looking at. The patients that we perform this test battery on uh, are a limited subset of our patient population. Um, the criteria that we'll use to trigger whether or not someone gets the postural evoked response test is primarily abnormal latencies on the motor control test. Also, those patients who primary complaint is not rotational vertigo, but rather a feeling of unsteadiness. Uh, and those folks that have lower leg symptoms, their legs are hot, cold, tingling, burning, numb, uh, so that we can evaluate why they have those symptoms. Uh, when we've done our core battery on the dynamic platform and look at the raw data for the motor control test, if we see increased settling time, so during that voluntary epoch of time after the automatic postural response, if we see a lot of variation around the center, uh, suggesting that it takes them a long time to calm back down to a steady stance, that'd be another trigger for doing the postural evoked response test, because that suggests that they have reduced use of somatosensory information in order to stabilize or dampen that response. Finally, if the sensory organization test shows a lot of high frequency, low amplitude sway in the anterior posterior direction, that'd be another trigger for performing the postural evoked response test. Uh, if a patient comes in to us and they've already been diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy, polyneuropathy, or radiculopathy affecting the lower legs, we would not go on to the postural evoked response test because it's not going to provide us any additional information. Uh, if we've got a subject who could not tolerate the adaptation test on computerized dynamic posturography, we would not do the postural evoked response test because They'd fall on that as well, and we wouldn't get any useful information. Uh, and if that patient has already had a needle EMG of the lower limbs, uh, we would not go on to the postural evoked response test because it would be essentially repeating the same sort of investigation. So uh, the way postural evoked response is interpreted is by performing the test, marking the latencies manually, and then comparing the latency and amplitude data you've obtained to publish normative data. We use Lawson et al. 1994, that was published in the Journal of Vestibular Research, uh, for our normative data. Um, keep in mind that when we're recording toes up tilts uh, and recording from tibialis and gastroc, that is the standard clinical protocol. But the postural evoked response test is very flexible. You can 
do any motion profile of the platform you'd like, translation, toes up, toes down, tilts, uh, and you can record from any muscle group you like. Um, the standard test protocol is just what we have published norms on. Uh, so certainly if you're going to uh, design your own custom test protocol, you can develop your own norms as well. Um, you've got multiple stimulus choices. You can record from any muscle you like. You can mark up to six data points per muscle response uh, tracing. Uh, and you can also export this data for analysis into any of your statistical programs. Uh, examples of the data, um, primarily what we look for in our patient population is prolonged latencies uh, when, uh, and the pattern of prolonged latencies, whether it's the short, medium, or long latency responses, provides diagnostic information about pathology within the system. Uh, this is a 34-year-old female whose complaint is rotational vertigo. Um, but also had some central nervous system findings that we wanted to investigate further. So when we performed the postural evoke response test, we found that the long latencies were prolonged, which is an indicator for central nervous system involvement. Uh, she also had absent middle latencies, again, another indicator of central nervous system involvement. And the final um, um, decision on this was that this was a patient who had early multiple sclerosis. Second case we'll be looking at is a case of increased amplitude. So all the timing of these responses were normal in this subject, um, but uh, the middle latency response is greatly enlarged, uh, and that's an indication of problems within the basal ganglia and or cerebellum. Um, this is probably what we see most often in my clinic is uh, folks with multifactorial involvement. Um, uh, often it's seen in the elderly, but we also see it in younger folks if they've got some sort of systemic disorder, most commonly diabetes. Um, and this is a patient who's got that combination of both vertigo and constant unsteadiness. She also complained to us of low back and leg pain. Um, her short latency responses were absent bilaterally, and that's a strong indicator for peripheral neuropathy affecting the lower limbs. Uh, this is a, a real-world test, and in the real world, electrodes and wires go bad, and that's what it looks like uh, when you've got a bad electrode lead. And uh, typically, the way to repair that would be to first try replacing your disposable electrode. If that doesn't resolve it, you may, need, you may have a bad electrode wire that needs to be replaced. Um, this is surface EMG recordings, which means if you've got a patient with a lot of adipose tissue uh, insulating the muscle response, you may not get a usable recording. In that case, you may need to refer on to the neurologist for a needle EMG study for this patient if it's an important question for you to answer. A uh, fair number of these recordings are noisy, particularly in patients who are unsteady on their feet because they have a lot of muscle activity as they're swaying around. Um, by knowing what your normative data is, you can often uh, scroll through a noisy recording in order to identify the takeoff point um, is basically pattern recognition, looking for the response amongst the noise. Uh, some of these responses are fairly low amplitude, so again, scrolling through and watching your uh, microvolt reading as you're scrolling through the timing of the response allows you to identify the takeoff point for some of these low amplitude responses. And that's it. This is a demonstration of the postural evoked response option for the Neurocom dynamic force plate test. Probably the most difficult part about the postural evoked response test is electrode placement. Once you get the electrodes placed, performing the test is actually pretty easy. This is a large muscle response, relatively speaking, so you don't need to do a whole heck of a lot of preparation 
before electrode placement. Primarily just cleaning the skin where the electrodes are going to be applied so that uh, they'll stick well. I rarely need to use any sort of electrode paste for this test. Uh, primarily just clean the skin with an alcohol swab, let it dry. To place the electrodes, take four fingers down from the knee joint. That will get you roughly in the right area for tibialis anterior. You want to find the belly of the muscle. Easiest way to do that when this patient is in sitting is to say, Christina, just push up against my hand. That's it. That'll cause that muscle to pop out. and You'll be able to find the belly of the muscle quite easily on most folks. This is a dual electrode array. Standard placement using these uh, MVU electrodes is just place them butt up against each other right over the belly of the muscle. Like all surface electrode recordings, the longer these electrodes sit on the skin, the better the impedance. Push hard for me. That's good right there. So if you're going to perform your core test battery on the dynamic platform and you know ahead of time that you're going to be doing the PER test. Um, it's very helpful to put the electrodes on before you go, uh, before you perform the computerized dynamic posturography test. That way the electrodes settle down very nicely by the time you get to do the PER after that. Five fingers down from the back of the knee in order to find the position. Push up against my hand. There you go. Just get that muscle to pop out to find the belly of the muscle. And this little reference electrode, just set it down as far as you can onto bone if possible. Push up again for me. Toes down, heel up. Very good. Relax. Okay, trickiest part is the transfer from sitting, because you've got all these wires to manage. Go ahead and stand up for me. Step up on the platform. That's it, facing the scenery. And standard foot placement. Leave the right foot out to the side for me. That's good right there. Left foot out slightly. That's fine, and you can splay your toes inward or outward for comfort. So after all this preparation is done, the test itself is quite simple. Okay, eyes opened or closed now, doesn't really matter. You'll feel 20 rapid toes up tilts. Um, just relax and think about standing as steadily as you can. Here it goes. One down, 19 to go. Well, it's trial 10, so you're halfway done. All right, that's 20 trials. This is data analysis for the postural evoked response test. From the comprehensive screen, click on Mark Responses. And that will show you averages of platform rotation, left gastroc, left tibialis, right gastroc, and right tibialis over the 20 trials. Uh, if you've got some noise in the recording that would make it difficult to identify the takeoff points for each of the measured latency responses, best thing to do is click on the channel you find noisiest, then click on Zoom, and try to visually identify the trials that have the most extraneous noise in them, 
and just delete them from your average. You can delete up to 12 trials. Uh, you'll get a good average recording as long as you have at least eight trials within the average. Once you've deleted the trials that you feel need to be gone, click back to go back to the average trial screen. Highlight the channel of interest and just scroll across until you identify the takeoff point. So we're on left gastroc now, and we're looking for the takeoff point of the short latency response, which should occur somewhere around 30 milliseconds. Looking at the microvolt measure, you can see where it starts to rise and continues to build. So find the floor of that response, mark it, and move across until you identify the end of the response. Continuing to scroll on the left gastroc channel till we find the medium latency takeoff point. And the end of the middle latency response. You'll see that there's another burst out here. This is crosstalk from the left tibialis channel. You'll see that frequently in these uh, surface electrode recordings. So it does take a little bit of experience to identify the true response from the noise in the response. So we're scrolling across left tibialis now, finding the takeoff point for the long latency response. And the end of that response when it comes back down to baseline. Right gastroc, scrolling to find the takeoff point for the short latency response. And the end of the short latency response. Takeoff point for middle latency. And end of the middle latency response. Finally, for the long latency response for right tibialis. Takeoff point. And end point. Click on update report to save these settings. And then to compare to your normative data, click on the numeric screen and then you will find the latencies to onset and offset and the integrated EMG response is your amplitude, the area under the curve.